If you follow the steps you've learned in the previous lessons, you will have already found the perfect source. You will also have taken into account the safety of your interviewee and secured informed consent. So now you're ready to start the interview. For a successful interview, you need your interviewee to feel as comfortable as possible. The more comfortable they are, the more they talk. And the more they talk, the more information you'll get out of them. Much of that comfort comes from you setting the scene properly and explaining who you are and what you're doing. By making sure they've had all the opportunity to ask you questions, they'll also be more comfortable. You should also give some thought to the space you meet in, which should ideally be private and safe. Then, always ask the interviewee if they are ready to get started. Start off by asking some simple questions about themselves to ease them into it. Can you tell me your name and age? My name is Samir Ibrahimi. I'm 39 years old. Where do you live? Tehran. What do you do in Tehran? What's your job? What were you doing to study? Or what activities do you do? I'm a journalist. I wrote for a daily newspaper in Iran. What gender do you identify as? I identify as a man. If relevant, you might also want to ask their ethnicity, nationality, or marital status. Then you want to let the interviewee tell their story. Your job is to guide their testimony into a narrative and to give the narrative structure. You should try to keep the narrative on a chronological track. It's best to start with open and broad questions about the beginning of your interviewee story, even if you know there is a specific event you want to ask them about. Make sure they don't miss any key details. Let's start at the beginning. What happened first? I was a journalist writing stories mostly about technology and science, like news about discoveries in cancer research, or the government builds a new recycling plant. Last year, some students came to me because they were expelled from their engineering program. They said it was because of their religion, and I was intrigued. And I thought, this was an interesting story about science and education. From there, your job is to listen. Let them tell you what they think is important. This will help you gain their trust. If they veer away from the relevant storyline, allow them to do so. Using your issue spotting techniques, you might uncover something unexpected. Once the interviewee gets going, you should minimize interruptions. You need to develop a rhythm with the interviewee. OK, what happened next? I talked to the students, and then I called a few of the professors and the administrators at the university to ask what happened. Most said they knew nothing about the case. The president's secretary confirmed the students were expelled for not meeting the school's criteria, but said the university had no more comment. So I wrote a short story, which was published in my paper, and that's when the trouble started. If the interviewee is stuck or is not that talkative, you might need to guide them. What was the trouble that started? The story got a lot of attention, and then I was threatened, and eventually I landed in jail. It was a big headache. OK. Maybe we can talk more about the attention the story got. The day after my story ran, I got a call from a BBC radio journalist that I know. She asked to interview me about the story. I basically repeated what I wrote, and I added that I thought it was a waste that the top science students were expelled when our country really needs their talent. After the interview, they came to my office and arrested me. Remember, you should avoid leading questions. A leading question is a question where an answer is implied in the question, because that might lead you to mistakes or to missing details. Here is an example of a leading question. It was intelligence officers that were arresting you? Yes, the intelligence. Let's have a look at what answer I would have gotten if I asked more open-ended questions. Do you know who arrested you? Intelligence. They did not say they were intelligence or have uniforms, but they took me to Evan Prison, and I was placed in a war I learned was controlled by the Revolutionary Guards. The officers, they seemed to work there. So I think it was, I think it was the Revolutionary Guards' intelligence, not the Ministry of Intelligence. During any testimony gathering, you are trying to establish the who, what, where, and why of a story. These are the most important details you need. So when there are natural breaks in the narrative, you can ask for specific details. What ward was it? Ward 2A. Okay. 
And did the arresting officers identify themselves or give their names? They didn't say much. An older man said that they were there to arrest me. I said, who are you? He said, Sergeant Mohammadi, no more questions. So I kept quiet. Questions involving timeline, dates, and numbers can be very important. But sometimes interviewees forget the specifics. If your witness can't recall the exact date, time, or key numbers, try for an approximation. Try to place the time in relation to an established event or offer a range. What was the date of your arrest? Do you remember? I don't remember exactly. At the prison, I was thrown into a solitary cell, and I did not see anyone for days. Do you remember the month and year? January 2014, I think. How many days or weeks after your BBC interview aired did you get arrested? Four or five days. Timing is vital because sometimes it can help you prove the intent behind the human rights violation. You also need to find out how this person knows the things they're telling you. Did they directly witness the event themselves? Did they hear about it from a witness? Or are they making assumptions and filling in the details? Often an interviewee will talk about things they did not witness directly. And if you choose to report one of these details, you should also say how they discovered the information. It was a stressful experience. The judge in my case was really cruel. He told my interrogator that a few weeks in solitary confinement would help me confess. They even wanted to use my wife against me. How do you know the judge said these things? Well, he told my interrogator to put me in solitary right in front of me during my first hearing. The intelligence officer then, he told me that the judge mentioned putting my wife in danger. Now remember, one of our key skills is issue spotting. If a witness provides a detail that seems to uncover another human rights violations, make sure you get all the relevant information. For example, threats can be a form of psychological torture. If you see a hint of a threat, ask about it. What happened with your wife? One day, my interrogator told me that if I did not confess, they would arrest my wife. He said it was the judge's idea and that they would charge her with drug dealing. That's a capital offense. I started to cry and beg them to leave her alone, but they said they already had her in the next room, and I heard her voice, so I, I confessed. Was your wife ever arrested? No. When I got out, she told me she never interacted with the authorities. She was never in prison, so... Um, it must have been some other woman, I guess. I, I, I really don't know. I, I was under a lot of pressure that day. Also, make sure they give detailed explanation of what happened. If the interviewee says something like, I was abused, or I was tortured, you'll need to prompt them by asking questions such as, what happened exactly? Or, who were you abused by? What do you mean by pressure? It was hours and hours of interrogation without breaks. I was asked over and over to confess to cooperating with foreign enemies. Confess, confess. Before you start, your research should prepare a list of questions that you want to find the answers to. You won't ask these questions directly in your interviews, but you'll try to guide the narrative so that you cover all of the important areas you've highlighted. You'll have different sets of standard questions for different subjects and you should make sure that you cover the same topic areas with all of your sources. That way, you can begin to see any patterns that might help you determine whether rights violations have taken place. Tick questions off your list and move through the interview. We've created a handout with some detailed examples of standard questions to get you started. Because these questions are really important when you're discussing police and judicial process. UN institutions will really want to know about each step of the process, and you need to make sure to ask. When you were arrested, did the officer show you a warrant? He showed me a piece of paper. I saw it had my name on it, but then he pulled it right away after that. I only saw my name and the words Revolutionary Court at the top. That's it. Were you formally charged with a crime by court? After seven or ten days of being in Evian prison, I was taken to a court for the first time. The judge asked me if I confessed to my crime. I said, what's my crime? He said, conspiring with the foreign power, acting against national security for speaking to the BBC, and spreading lies about the system. Had you seen a lawyer at this point? No, I didn't see my lawyer until the day before the trial. Okay. Thank you.
This is a standard type of interview we would do to assess if an individual has suffered any human rights violations. Hopefully, you could see how asking questions in a particular way gives you the most information possible. At the end of this chapter, you'll be able to take a fun interactive quiz to test whether you're able to spot the different types of questions we've taught you about in this lesson.